On primetime politics tonight, from words to action, politicians have spoken out against the killing of a Muslim family in London, Ontario, but the Muslim community wants to see real change to fight Islamophobia. We'll speak with two Muslim leaders about what's needed. And MPs will debate next steps and what role federal parties must uh, take beyond just condemning acts of hatred. The federal government is doing away with the mandatory hotel quarantine for Canadian travellers who've been fully vaccinated. We'll have more on that. And the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations on the government's refusal to drop legal battles involving Indigenous children and the next step in pushing for a papal apology for the role of the Catholic Church in the tragedy of Indian residential schools. We'll begin tonight with a call to action from Canada's Muslim community, a call echoed well beyond that community as well. It's been 24 hours since thousands of people gathered for a vigil in London, Ontario, to remember the family of four, the Afsal family, wiped out after a 20-year-old man slammed into them, deliberately, police say, because they were Muslim, and then drove away, leaving them to die. A nine-year-old boy survived. The many speakers, including federal and provincial political leaders, denounced anti-Muslim hate and condemned the attack as terrorism and promised action. Islamophobia is real. Racism is real. You should not have to face that hate in your communities, in your country. We can and we will act. We can and we will choose a better way. But what comes after grief is commitment. We have to commit ourselves to working across party lines, with premiers, with mayors, with faith leaders, to end the kind of violence and hatred that took these lives. So I commit to you that I will be an ally in fighting for a future where families can walk the streets without fear. Muslim brothers and sisters can walk the streets without looking over their corners. No one should be afraid of who they are. Together we will stand and build a Canada where no one is afraid, where we all are celebrated for who we are. And today in the House of Commons, the Prime Minister was pressed again about what specific measures the government will take to fight Islamophobia. What happened in London, this act of terrorism, shows us that Islamophobia is a serious issue and it has no place in Canada or around the world. Whether through the security infrastructure program, by cracking down on online extremism, or by dismantling far-right hate groups, we will continue doing everything we can to fight violence in every form. We grieve with Muslim communities across Canada and stand with them in solidarity during this difficult time. So we have promises of action from political leaders in the aftermath of the death of the four family members killed in that hit and run attack in London, Ontario. What does the Muslim community want to see by way of real action and real change from our political leaders? Nadia Hassan is the Chief Operating Officer of the National Council of Canadian Muslims and Nawaz Tahir is a lawyer in London, Ontario and the Chair of London's anti-Islamophobia advocacy organization, HICMA. Uh, he was one of the speakers at the vigil uh, Tuesday night. Thank you both for taking time to speak with me today and I offer my condolences to uh, both of you for the loss of these four members of, of the community and thanks for taking time Thank to you. speak with me tonight. Uh, Nadia, let me start with you. Uh, there have been calls for a national summit on Islamophobia. Who would be at that summit and what would be the objective of that summit? Uh, that's a good question. I think um, the the purpose of that summit is really to tackle Islamophobia uh, in all its forms. Uh, we know that what happened in London is something that is rooted in a deep-seated Islamophobia that that individual harbored, and that doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, it's not something that, you know, just happens in a vacuum. Um, however, what we want to see is uh, multiple levels of government so that includes our federal leaders from all political parties, uh, provincial leaders, as well as municipal and territorial leaders to come together and talk about the problem of Islamophobia, what they can do within their own jurisdictions, because this is a, a problem that requires a whole of society approach. Mr. Tahir, lots of promises of action from political leaders of all uh, stripes. Uh, what do you want to see beyond the calling of a, of a summit, important in and of itself? But what specifically uh, do you think our political leaders need to be looking at to fight Islamophobia in this country and these acts of violence against Muslim Canadians? 
So I think there are a few uh, specific pieces to the puzzle. One, we need to give our police forces across Canada the opportunity and the resources to research all that is out there. Uh, we know that in a number of these attacks, the attackers, the terrorists mm -hmm. that have done this, have been online. And, and we know that in the dark web, uh, that type of a community exists. So we need to give police officers, uh, law enforcement agencies across the country, the tools to be able to properly research, understand what's going on there, so that if, uh, God forbid, an attack like this were to happen, the, it has been properly researched and, and those hate crime charges or terrorism charges can go ahead. We also need specific mm -hmm. Uh, legislation, hate crime legislation that has teeth to it, mm. that doesn't handcuff police or hand handcuff the prosecution. I mean, is of, one of, of the these one of the is one of the big issues that you know we we look at uh, the laws in this country and uh, typically uh, the terrorism uh, laws in the country are, are are dealing with measures aimed at trying to prevent terrorist attacks before they happen. And there's a, a, certainly lots of uh, discussion, and I think you might be alluding to it here, but uh, the need to make uh, terrorism charges easier to to lay after a crime has been committed. Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, both terrorism charges and hate crime charges. The legislation needs to have more teeth to allow these to be investigated more properly and, and allow these charges to come forward uh, without some of the uh, additional uh, barriers that have been created in the current manifestations of the legislation. Uh, Nadia, let me ask you, uh, in, in this same context, why is it important? We heard, you know, not all, but most of the political leaders we've been hearing from on this have been uh, able to refer to this as, as terrorism. Why is it so important to have them call it that and for police to pursue it as that? Um, I think that it is, it is extremely important that our, our, uh, our political leaders call it that because that is uh, what it is. And I think it's simply a matter of accuracy, a matter of actually recognizing something that, that has all the hallmarks of a terrorist act as a terrorist act. Uh, and we had an opportunity to do that previously uh, with in the Quebec City massacre, uh, which didn't happen. But this mm -hmm. time, I think we have, uh, we want to hear from our leadership that they do acknowledge that this is indeed a, t a form of terrorism. But on uh, secondarily, I think what it does um, is that it actually it sends a message. Uh, and the message is that uh, crimes of this nature that are fueled by hate and Islamophobia, uh, that, they would, that they will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And that's a really important message for all Canadians to hear mm. uh, and for all Canadians to understand that the, our governments actually have our safety in mind. Mr. Tahir, uh, we've seen some politicians uh, uh, talk about their concerns about have, you know balancing tougher measures to deal with uh, with hate crimes and Islamophobia, but also you know their concerns about balancing uh, free speech. Um, what's your message to them? My message to them at the at the vigil, uh, and my message to them today is the same. What is the point of having freedom of expression when a Canadian family does not have the freedom to walk on a sidewalk without being murdered? Okay, so elaborate on that for me. I mean, I mean, if they, 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 some politicians try to make this argument that look, okay, we're looking at, we're prepared to go further, but we do have to be careful about when free speech extends, uh, what you know, how to make sure that we haven't shut down free speech. So, in that context, is there a way to discuss that balance and to achieve that balance? Well, we know even in, in Canada's constitutional system that freedom of expression is not absolute uh, through legislation, uh, through civil law remedies, uh, and even our constitution itself says uh, that those uh, freedoms are, are, have to be reasonably limited in a free and democratic society. So we know that there are all, already some parameters over that, um, and we need to, to talk about and think about how this affects the ability of people to feel like they belong in our country and are, and are valued people and members of our community. Um, Nadia, we've seen uh, in some previous elections campaigns, we've seen uh, uh, some politicians e exploit uh, differences in communities rather than celebrate them. Uh, we could soon be in another federal election campaign. What's your message to the political parties? 
Well, I think it's pretty clear that the politics of division, they don't work and they have consequences. Um, it's really important right now for our political leaders to understand this, as you said, as we're, we're heading into an election. Uh, but really, th there are lives at stake here. And that's not an exaggeration. Their words matter, how they handle themselves, how they ensure that there is no place for Islamophobia or racism or xenophobia within their parties. Uh, those are really important steps to take going into an election. Uh, Mr. Tier, you, you spoke at the vigil last night, and I, I thought it was interesting. You related the story of how a foreign reporter asked you how come this is happening in Canada, uh, viewed as one of the most tolerant countries in the world. Uh, you told us about the question he asked you, but I didn't hear you answer the question. What, what did you say to that reporter who said, how is this happening in Canada? Well, what I said to him is this is a, a problem that isn't unique to Canada. Well, we're seeing examples of Islamophobia around the world and how Muslims are being treated around the world. And there are a number of examples of that. Um, and so Canada isn't unique. And, and we need to come together from a worldwide perspective in, in, in addressing this issue of, of hate. All right. Uh, let's see where this takes us in terms of uh, future actions and next steps by uh, political leaders in this country. Thank you both for your time tonight. Uh, it's good to talk to you. And again, my uh, condolences for the losses in your community. Thank you. Thank you. So the Muslim community has set its expectations for federal politicians on what's needed to fight Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hate in this country. Let's bring in three members of parliament to respond to those calls to action. Ikra Khalid is a Mississauga Liberal MP and chair of the Commons Justice Committee. She is also a Muslim member of parliament. Tim Upple is an Edmonton Conservative MP and the caucus party liaison for the official opposition. And Lindsay Matheson is a New Democrat MP from the City of London and her party's critic for diversity, inclusion and youth. Thank you all for uh, taking time to speak with me tonight. I Ikra Khalid, let me start with you. There uh, seems now to be a consensus inside the Muslim community that the first step to action uh, needs to be a national summit on Islamophobia. Do you support that demand and have you had any discussions with the Prime Minister to make that happen? I absolutely support that demand and Peter as you may recall uh, in 2017 when I tabled motion 103 the main ask of that motion was to bring in that whole of government approach and I think that a summit uh, would bring in all levels of government in order to really ensure that this conversation that that the calls to action really get to its implementation. Uh, and uh, and I, I look forward to continuing to advocate for this. Okay, Mr. Apple, uh, would your party support the call for a national summit on Islamophobia and, and take part in that summit? Yeah, I mean, I would welcome that, an opportunity to have discussions about how um, you know, we as, uh, as Canadians, but also parliamentarians, how we could be a part of that solution, how we can help uh, Canadians get to know each other better and, uh, and, and learn how Islamophobia has, a, has affected the Muslim community. I think that would be a good idea. And what about you, Lindsay Matheson? I'm assuming you're, uh, you'll make it unanimous here that we should have a summit. Uh, absolutely. It's something that was clearly stated uh, repeatedly uh, last night at the vigil in London. Um, but I, I did ask the Prime Minister today directly in, in question period, and I did not get that response uh, positively back. So I hope that the members here uh, can bring that forward as well. Ikra Khalid, Muslim community leaders have told us uh, they want to see more resources for police to track online hate and specific hate crimes legislation with more teeth to allow for tougher penalties. Uh, what can we expect from your government? Will your government move forward on those kinds of measures? Um, that's a great question. And I, I have to say, uh, you know, over these past four years, uh, from the uh, the start of the, the Quebec mosque shooting um, through the whole process of having that national conversation about whether Islamophobia is real, to now realizing that Islamophobia is absolutely real in our communities and having to face the, the gruesome deaths of, uh, of four uh, prominent members within the, the London community, I think there absolutely needs to be more to be done. And over the past number of years, I've been consistently saying that this really requires that, that all of uh, levels of government approach and a pol the, the police are a okay. huge part of, of that government. Uh, and, then, and that, so uh, that are you satisfied with the pace of, of uh, the action that your government's been taking? 
I think that we absolutely need to pick up that pace, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we haven't had uh, those difficult conversations. And, and like I said, in 2017, we did have that difficult conversation within our, our own House of Commons and, uh, and, and continue to have those conversations. Mr. Apple, two things the experts suggest uh, can be done as policymakers and legislators. Provide more resources to law enforcement agencies to investigate possible cases of, of uh, terrorism, uh, Islamophobia, especially when it involves lone actors, as would appear to be the case in London, and also actually defining ideologically motivated and what, what that means, because it's not in the criminal code, and that leaves investigators often uncertain on how to proceed. So would your party support those kinds of changes and, and perhaps making those changes urgently? Yeah, we would support that. I mean, I think it's important that we do have conversations on how we can uh, better support uh, police. We've called on, on uh, the government to do so. We've talked about uh, the cracking down on online hate and bringing forward measures to, um, to, to uh, you know, crack down on, on uh, what's happening on the internet where uh, some people are getting radicalized. Um, and, and also measures that are already in um, law right now. And when we were in government, uh, uh, the, we changed the criminal code to, uh, so that uh, murderers would, uh, can receive consecutive sentences for multiple murders. And right now, the, uh, the, sh the, the murderer from the uh, Quebec City Mosque shooting, um, you know, we would like to see him uh, serve consecutive sentences, and I would hope that the liberals would up, up, uh, defend the, the because it's because it's in front of uh, the courts right now that law that they would defend that law and um, make this murder uh, serve multiple sentences, things like that to actually let's let's educate uh, Canadians, let's get the police involved, give them the tools that they need, but also strengthen the laws itself. Lindsay Matheson, what's your view on more funding for law enforcement and uh, tougher penalties? Um, more funding is, is absolutely a key part of that, and, and it's something that New Democrats have called upon in um, uh, past platforms uh, as well. Um, and I think a key part of that, too, uh, that uh, Mr. Ubel had discussed was that education piece. That is huge, and the funding for that for organizations to ensure that that uh, piece of education, that outreach that can happen. I know it's something that my community in London has been talking about for a very long time. They've been working uh, in, in interfaith groups to do that, not just the Muslim community, uh, but to do that key amount of outreach. And I think that, that these are also those key points that we need to discuss in a summit that is brought forward, um, whether it's about justice or education or policing, all of it needs to be discussed. Ikra Khalid, uh, you touched on it in 2017. The House passed your motion condemning Islamophobia, but 91 conservative MPs voted against it then, including uh, the current party leader, Aaron O'Toole, claiming it was a, a threat to free speech. Uh, it, it was a divisive and bitter debate. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how can politicians agree to, to move forward and take tougher measures to counter anti-Muslim hate attacks if they, uh, if they can't all agree to condemn Islamophobia? Um, you know what, it really, uh, it's, it's about uh, understanding the, the needs of Canadians and, and understanding the vulnerabilities that Muslim Canadians are going through. And uh, from 2017 until now, I'm very happy to hear uh, Mr. O'Toole is now recognizing Islamophobia, is using the term Islamophobia uh, regularly in recognizing the, the hate that occurs to, uh, to the Muslim community over these uh, past number of years. And I, I have to say to, to Mr. O'Toole, who mentioned uh, some of the, the actions of the previous government. It, it was the previous government that removed Section 13 from our Human Rights Code, uh, from the Human Rights Act, which would allow for online hate crimes, for example, to have a, um, a, a, you know, a, a system of, uh, of, of victim recognition uh, and, and for justice. I think that those are measures that really do need to be brought back, and I would love the support of, uh, of all parties in the House to, to get that done. Mr. Apple, we're, we're, you know, we could be heading into an election campaign before too long, and we've seen uh, uh, how this issue uh, has been divisive in past election campaigns. What do you think the message uh, is coming from the Muslim community and from the broader Canadian community about what, you know, how, you know, uh, what they want to hear from politicians this time around what they don't want to hear uh, about these kinds of issues involving uh, uh, Islamophobia, perhaps, as a divisive issue in an election campaign. I think it's important to recognize that Islamophobia is real. It's, uh, it's negatively, deeply negatively has affected the Muslim community. And uh, I think it's our job to listen. 
Um, it's not always for us to uh, go out there and, and make these grand uh, statements. It's for us to listen to the Muslim community and, and find out how we can help as, as, uh, as legislators. What can we bring forward to help um, Canadians get to know each other better, have, have that better understanding? And uh, I, I think that, that's important and that's, that's our job here. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Lindsay Matheson, to wrap up our conversation? Um, listening is key and, and using uh, a lot of these divisive tactics uh, clearly isn't working. Uh, and, and it's one of the things that um, I hope to bring to my community and from my community is that voice that we need to do this together, that we stand shoulder to shoulder uh, to fight this kind of, of hate. And the one thing that came out of that vigil last night with those 15,000 people is their focus on love and hope and peace. And so that's what we need to focus on as well. All right. Thank you all for your time tonight. We'll anxiously await next steps uh, on this story. I appreciate you taking the time to talk about it tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. The federal government has announced it is ending the mandatory hotel quarantine for returning air travelers starting in early July, as long as they've had two doses of vaccine. And returning travelers no longer have to self-isolate for 14 days when that happens. Instead, they'll be required to present a negative COVID-19 test before they fly to Canada and will need a second test when they land. And then they'll only have to isolate until that test comes back negative. We're aiming for early July, and I know that uh, um, you would prefer a precise date, but we are working with CBSA, IRCC, and a number of other departments to make sure that we're operationally ready for this change. Other news, the federal government has reached a class action settlement uh, with those residential school students who attended the schools during the day but returned home at night because they live nearby, so-called day scholars. The settlement includes compensation of $10,000 for each eligible survivor or their descendants. The settlement also includes a $50 million fund to support healing and reclamation of language and culture. Once approved by the federal court, compensation and other benefits will be available to eligible class members. And it is my sincere hope that this will unlock a healing process for all those involved. Well, the federal government also confirmed today it will continue its legal challenges to a pair of human rights tribunal decisions. One of those decisions awarded $40,000 in compensation to 50,000 First Nations children placed in foster care. Another ruling orders governments to provide services immediately to First Nations children on or off reserve who need them and argue later about which level of government should pay for those costs. The court fights continue even though the House of Commons unanimously passed a non-binding motion presented by the NDP earlier this week calling on the government to drop the legal challenges as a concrete step in reconciliation. Perry Bellegarde is the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. He joins me now. Chief Bellegarde, good to see you again. Thanks for your time tonight, sir. Thanks for the opportunity, Peter. Uh, Minister Miller confirmed it today. The Prime Minister did as well, saying the uh, court challenges to the human rights rulings will continue uh, when they're back in court next week. What's your reaction to that? Well, I would hope that the, the judicial review that the federal government is doing and launching against the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal decision would stop. Um, you know, you're, you're basically fighting kids, First Nations kids. And, uh, you know, we took many, many years for the CHRT decision, tribunal decision, to come out. Uh, and so I, I, I would say it, the energy and effort and human financial resources fighting this would be better spent on implementing the CHRT tribunal's decision. Right. That, that's my reaction. The government says, uh, look, it's, the government says uh, our role and, and purpose for going to court, uh, we want to challenge the human right tri uh, rights tribunal's jurisdiction in these matters. And uh, the government says it's hoping for an out-of-court settlement that, uh, that would see some children receive more compensation than others based on their experiences in the flawed care system. So what's wrong with the government's uh, position, the government's arguments on this? Well, I would say, like, stop the judicial review and then make a fair offer because uh, we, we do have a class action suit mm -hmm. and the teams mm -hmm. are working together, lobbying, negotiating together. And uh, I think if the, the federal government was serious, they would come up with a really good, fair compensation package for First Nations children. There's three components. The children component, the family component, and the Jordan's principal component. And um, I believe if they're going to be serious about resolving this, uh, then a fair compensation package should be offered. How do you view the fact that the, the Liberal cabinet on, on this motion earlier this week abstained from the vote and the Prime Minister didn't cast a vote at all? 
Well, obviously, political solidarity. And, uh, you know, that that's basically what it says and what it means. Um, I just encourage them all again uh, to get to the table, make a fair compensation package so we, we can get this resolved. It's taking many, many years to get the CHRT tribunal decision. Uh, there's no need for a judicial review. Uh, we, we looked at the legal court challenge or the uh, class action suit to bring about fairness and justice for children. And uh, the teams are working very diligently. There's a lot of dedication. There's a lot of goodwill on both sides. Uh, I just hope we can resolve it sooner than later. Uh, there will be another uh, motion from the NDP that it hopes to put before the House of Commons tomorrow, this one calling on the government to recognize what happened in the uh, Indian residential schools was an act of genocide. It's not clear the party will even uh, get unanimous consent tomorrow to put that motion before the House. Uh, we'll have to wait and see on Thursday. But what do you hope will happen? I hope it will pass, Peter, because I have I've publicly stated that the residential school system was a genocide on First Nations people. And if you look at the definition internationally about uh, the definition of genocide, it's forcibly removing children from their territories, inflicting harm, you know, and so there's no question uh, through the residential school system, there was harm, there's even death. And the 215 uh, grave site, these special sacred little children have been discovered and they're speaking very, very loudly. Um, so in my mind, in, in my determination, estimation, it does meet the definition of genocide. And I would hope that the uh, the appropriate vote passes because that's what it is. And you have to call it what it is. It was a genocide of our people. And we still feel the intergenerational trauma and the effects of the residential school system. And the entire country still uh, coming to terms with, as you touched on, the discovery of the remains of those 215 children uh, at the site of the previous school in, in Kamloops. Uh, you're planning a trip uh, to the Vatican, I think, uh, set for November to in, in invite the Pope to... Uh, uh, finally make an apology uh, for the the role of the Catholic Church in this. He's still not yeah. done that. Uh, had the opportunity last Sunday. Some people thought he might, but he didn't. Um, tell me about this trip and what you hope to achieve. Well, again, uh, we're working very closely with the Canadian Council on Catholic Bishops, and uh, we'd hope that there'd be a consensus there to support everybody on this going forward. Um, we have a, a, a bilateral relationship, or if you will, a, a work relationship with the Catholic Bishops, with the AFN, and so we were planning a trip uh, to, to go to the Vatican as well, to, to meet with His Holiness, to, to make the request formally, uh, to come back to Canada, and to make the formal apology to the survivors and the families here, because that's all part of healing, that's part, part of closure. And the Roman Catholic Church is the only church in Canada not to make that formal apology. The United Church has apologized, the Presbyterian Church, you know, uh, the Anglican Church has apologized. Uh, this would be a very meaningful, a very special time to have His Holiness come to Canada to, to make that formal apology and, and speak to the survivors and their families. And so we're going to keep working towards that end. And uh, it's a very important time. It's all part of truth-telling. It's all part of reconciliation and healing. And, and why is it so important, Chief Bellegarde, that... that uh, before you can move forward in, in the healing process and whatever connection that has to the Catholic Church, that apology from the Pope has to come first. Why is that so important? Well, it's all part of healing. You know, the, the Catholic Church had a very big role uh, in administration of the genocide of our people. It was a residential school policy that was from government, but the churches helped implement that policy of genocide. And to have uh, the, the highest office of the, the Catholic Church, which is the Pope's office, His Holiness, to come to Canada as per the TRC uh, call to action number 58, to make that uh, public apology and statement of sorrowness uh, to the survivors would mean a lot to the survivors and families. And uh, that's all part of healing. And we need to move beyond the residential school system and start healing. And, and so it's a very major piece mm -hmm. to that. So we're going to keep advocating for that to happen. All right, Chief Belgard, we'll uh, continue to watch how that, uh, the attempts to get that apology unfold. And I appreciate your time tonight. Uh, always good to talk to you. Take care. Thanks for the opportunity again. That is all the time we have for this edition of Primetime Politics. I'm Peter Van Dusen from all of us here at CPAC. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.